Please stand for the reading of God's word. Hear the word of the Lord from Acts 21, 15 to 36. After these days, we got ready and went up to Jerusalem. And some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us, bringing us to the house of Nason of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we should lodge. When we had come to Jerusalem, the brothers received us gladly. On the following day, Paul went with us to James, and all the elders were present. After greeting them, he related one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they had heard it, they glorified God, and they said to him, You see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who believed. They are all zealous for the law, and they have been told about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or to walk according to our customs. When or what then is to be done? They will certainly hear that you have come. Do therefore what they tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. Take these men and purify yourself along with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads. Thus all will know there is nothing in what they have been told about you, but that you yourself also live in observance of the law. But as for the Gentiles who have believed, we have sent a letter with our judgment that they should abstain from what has been sacrificed of two idols and from blood and from what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. Then Paul took the men, and the next day he purified himself along with them and went to the temple, giving notice when the days of the purification would be fulfilled and the offering presented for your, each one of them. When the seven days were almost completed, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who is teaching everyone against the people and the law and this place. Moreover, he even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, with him in the city, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. Then all the city was stirred up, and the people ran together. They seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple, and at once the gates were shut. And as they were seeking to kill him, word came to the tribune of the cohort that all Jerusalem was in confusion. He at once took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw the tribune and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the tribune came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. He inquired who he was and, that, and what he had done. Some of the crowds were shouting one thing, some another. And as he could not learn the facts because of the uproar, he ordered him to be brought into the barracks. And when he came to the steps, he was actually carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the crowd. For the mob of the people followed, crying out, away with him. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. It's <clears throat> a lot of text we're going to try to cover today. I'll try not to preach the everlasting gospel today, but um, I know you're hungry and you're going to start smelling that food here, so it's going to be a little torture. But today um, we're going to consider kingdom rejoicing, and yes, kingdom suffering. And we see both of those themes uh, very boldly uh, explained to us and, and presented to us here in our text. I don't know if you got the memo when you became a Christian, um, you were not granted immunity from the realities of living in a fallen world. In fact, uh, if anything, when you became a Christian, your life became that much more complicated. Uh, I watched a little documentary, I don't know if you've seen it online, about Keith Green. And I, I grew up in the Jesus People movement, and you need to watch that, it's an interesting thing. But probably the, the most famous line from the Keith Green uh, songs uh, was this one. Like waking up from the longest dream, how real it seemed until your love broke through. Some have compared becoming a Christian, remember the movie The Matrix, uh, some have compared being a Christian was what? Taking the red pill. Your choice, blue pill or red pill. If you take the red pill, you're going to be able to understand and see some things that you not otherwise would. And so you were red-pilled when you became a Christian. 
And now spiritual realities that you were utterly oblivious to before that have become very clear to you. And now, because you become in union with Jesus Christ, guess what? All of his enemies are now your enemies. Because that's the spiritual reality we're in. We don't merely wrestle with flesh and blood. We do have flesh and blood wrestling we have to do in this world. But it's not merely with flesh and blood. There's powers and principalities and and wickedness in heavenly places, and they're very real, and they are swirling all around us whether we realize it or not. And so by God's grace, hopefully, our eyes have been opened to the fact that that this is the world that we live in that has a really powerful, unseen spiritual dimension to it. And in this world, there's going to be some ups and downs, there's going to be ebbs and flows, and there's going to be some suffering. But we see that in perspective because God has given us the light of eternity. Peter put it this way, in this, in in this salvation, you rejoice. Though now for a little while... If necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So there is no immunity. We are going to face trials in this world. And by God's grace, he's going to enable you to persevere through them. And in the persevering through them, what is revealed? The genuineness of our faith. The reality that Christ is there. And when we walk through these trials as hard and as real as they are, ultimately, God is glorified. So that's why I put in your notes, God does not waste your trials. We're going to see this on display here in this narrative that we're working through uh, today. And if you, if you haven't been with us through the whole Book of Acts series, um, some of this is, uh, will make a little bit more sense to those of us who see it in the larger context. But we see some important truths here uh, for us this morning. First of all, we see that there is a genuine rejoicing In God's mission. Rejoicing in God's mission. Notice what it says in verse 15. After those days we got ready. We went up to Jerusalem. This is the apostolic team that Paul had been traveling with. And some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us. And they went into the house of Mason of Cyprus. An early disciple with whom they would lodge. Verse 17. And when we had come into Jerusalem, the brothers received us gladly. On the following day, Paul went in to us with James and the other elders were present. After greeting them, he related one by one the things that, had, that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry, and when they heard it, they glorified God. That's a wonderful thing. The Bible says, how blessed, are, how beautiful are those, are the feet of those who what? Who bring good news, right? So Paul is coming in. Paul had gone out. Uh, preaching the gospel all around the Gentile world, largely in Asia. And uh, the Lord was moving. And so he comes back to the mother church. He comes back to Jerusalem. And remember, though, there's there's this tension. And we're going to see this. It shows up many times in scriptures. Remember, the, the whole history of the Jews, they were taught they were God's elect people, right? God's chosen people. And they were to be separate, separate from who? from those Gentiles out there. Now things are are changing, right? Now God is going out of his way, it seems like, to bring the gospel to these Gentiles. And the Jews are kind of in this awkward place of trying to sort out what that means. After all, the the Gentiles were those unwashed pagan idolaters. And yet the gospel goes there. And isn't that the good news? The gospel invites all kinds of sinners to repent and to believe and be saved. I put in your notes, though, there is something inside all believers that yearns to see people come to faith in Christ. It's it's inescapable. And so, 
And, and by the way, we don't want to see people come to faith in Christ so that we can think, see, we were right all along. It's not about us. It's not about our ego that we prove. See, you should have listened to me a long time ago, right? It's not about us. We know in Acts 4.12 that there's salvation in no one else. For there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Yes, We do. We want them to be saved. Even our own family members who are away from Christ. Why? Because apart from Christ, they're doomed. I know that's not a happy thought, but if that's not true, then the gospel is irrelevant. This is life and death, heaven and hell, and eternities in the balance. And so we do. We want to see individuals come to faith in Christ for their own sake. But it's even greater than that. We want to see our Lord, our Christ, receive the reward of His obedience. Even the worship of all nations, the Bible says, because it's right and it's good for Christ to be adored from every tongue and tribe and people and nation because He alone is worthy. And where's my Baptist? Let me get an amen. Okay. Churches that are focused outwardly in my years of pastoral ministry and were focused on reaching others for Christ and were willing to get our hands dirty and serve in the community and uh, associate with those unclean Gentiles, right? With those people who have problems and addictions and brokenness and let's admit it, you know, their lives are a mess and if you're going to get involved in their lives, it's going to cost you something. You have to go out of your way. You're going to have to help them. You're going to have to be patient with them. You're going to have to be kind with them. You're going to have to be inconvenienced. But if we don't become that church, what happens is then churches turn on themselves. We start focusing on each other and getting all up into one another's business, maybe in an inordinate way. So I want to challenge you. For these next few weeks, we have a golden opportunity. According to some polls that have been taken out there, 46% of people say they're going to go to church in the next few weeks. It's Easter, right? And so the the culture, if you will, has served up to you a golden opportunity to bring up Jesus. And so I want you, you say, well, I'm not an evangelist. I get it. It can be a little intimidating to do that, but we need to learn to get over that. I'll try to equip you to do that. But at least you can invite someone to come to church, right? So would you? Begin to pray. Who is it that the Lord would invite you? And I promise you on Easter Sunday, I will preach a very, very gospel-centered, Jesus-honoring message so that you will know that they will hear the gospel clearly. I'll do your preaching for you. How's that? But I can't do the relating. And then invite them to your house for lunch or whatever. Make it a great day for them and invite them to come to church. We will also, uh, on that Easter Sunday, we're going to have new members that are going to be installed, which is great. We may actually have some baptisms. And by the way, if you want to take the next step in your walk with the Lord, if you have not been baptized, please uh, let me know on the connection card there, and uh, we will uh, be looking uh, to do that. Now, can I do a little bit of a, a rabbit trail with you? Forgive me for doing this. Because when you bring up Easter... Um, I don't know if you were like me, uh, there's a lot of static out there in the system. So why do we call it Easter? Have you heard all of the, the scuttle about that? Uh, and, and these are sincere people, people of goodwill and good conscience, and they say, well, you, can't, you shouldn't say the word Easter. Have you heard that? Um, well, according to some people, they say Easter is actually associating uh, with, this, with a pagan name, uh, Ishtar and some Anglo-Saxon name. Now, virtually every part of the kingdom of God except the Germanic people and the English-speaking people don't don't call it Easter, right? They call it Paschal, which is from the Hebrew Passover, okay? So how in the world did we get Easter? And so the uh, historian Glenn Sunshine uh, says as he studied this, linguistics... Our linguistic uh, scholars have determined we named 
uh, Easter, Easter because of a, a mistranslation of all things. Now, this is a little uh, complicated, but let me see if I can make it simple. Now, remember, during the, most of the early church age, the official language of the church was Latin, right? So they were speaking Latin to one another. And so the first day of Holy Week, or not the first day, Easter, uh, the last day of Holy Week, was called Sunday in white, or if you want to hear it in Latin, Dominica in Albus, Sunday in white. Why would they wear white? Because on Easter Sunday, that's when people would get baptized. So they would wear white, and so they ended up calling it Sunday in white. And so that got translated into the German, but rather than hearing Albus, which is white, um, the Germans heard Albus as the plural of Alba, which is the Latin word for dawns. And even then, it's kind of an interesting word. So they translated it, Estarum, Estarum, Sunday of dawns. Well, Jesus rose early on the third day. So that's why I put in your note, eventually Estarum, Jewish for dawns, came down to us as Easter. Now, why do I say that? Because some people of good conscience think, oh, if we say the word Easter, somehow we're invoking pagan deities. Let me assure you, on Easter Sunday, we will not be worshiping any pagan deities, okay? Um, and so, uh, don't be inhibited if we speak of the word Easter, and again, just a weird uh, linguistic mistranslation got it all the way down to us today. But by the way, uh, and, and what is the fear? that we, There's a thing called syncretism. We're bringing in stuff from outside that doesn't belong in the church. By the way, is there any syncretism today? There's some real syncretism going on, right? Uh, even this week, uh, we saw, or we've, we've done some teaching here on the Enneagram and its roots and its sources. I don't know if you've heard of the Enneagram. It comes to us out of a very dark pagan place, and now it's being smuggled into the church. And even the, the person who is the editor of Christianity Today, Russell Moore, I mean, that's probably one of the most premier positions in all evangelical uh, culture. Russell Moore is speaking in favor of the Enneagram at a conference. Now, how is it that we're getting all this pagan stuff coming in? We definitely want to keep the paganism out, just like we're trying to keep the Marxism out of the church and the, all humanistic ideologies. But trust me, on Easter Sunday, we will exuberantly and shamelessly rejoice in Christ and Christ's triumphant victory. And we'll even take some time out to mock death. How's that? Our last enemy. Because that's what Easter is all about. So no syncretism on Easter Sunday. So we see here then, uh, back to our text, uh, just something of another aside that I want us to look at. So notice, Paul, he's been out on his third missionary journey. He's come back to Jerusalem. He's reporting back, it says, to James and the elders. So James pulls all the elders of, of Jerusalem together, and, and Paul and James come in and, and have a report. And notice, again, the plurality of church government. And that's what I want us to see. What is biblical church government? So even these men, great men, the Apostle Paul, James, the great head of the church in a certain way in Jerusalem, they still were subject to other elders. In fact, the Apostle Peter, who's uh, the rock, right? And the Apostle John, the Apostle of love, guess what they call themselves? Elders. Look in 1 Peter 5, 1. The elders which are among you, I exhort you, Peter says, who am also an elder. Peter saw himself as an elder. Look in, in first, or 2 John and 3 John. They're both addressed the same way. The elder to the elect lady, the elder to Gaius. And so even though they were the 12, think of this, they were the 12 that were called by Jesus when they were in community. When they were in the church, 
they were an elder. They were, there was parity. And I say that because there are some who want to think of themselves as super elders. And beware of that because they want to lord over the church. And they, they want to assert authority in the church. And what I wanted you to see here, even those members of the 12 that, that you were u- uniquely called. By the way, when we get to the new heavens and the new earth, it says we see the new heavens coming out of, out of, uh, out of heaven, or the, new, the city of God coming out of heaven, and the foundation has 12 layers. And what are in the 12 layers? The names of who? The 12 apostles. So these, these are foundational guys, right? These are powerful, if you will, men in, in that respect. And yet, when they were in the church... When they were in community with each other, they were elders. So beware of being in spiritual environments where there's super elders, somebody who's in charge, who's not accountable. If these men are accountable, how much more would someone like me need to be accountable, right? And that's why we need you men to step up and become officers in the church, and that's what we're praying for. We need deacons, we need elders, and, we're, and we will have, hopefully, in a, the next few weeks after we install new members, uh, nominations for new officers. Because I need other elders. I need to be accountable. And we need the, the wisdom and the plurality of that. And is, isn't it interesting that that was functioning in Jerusalem? And Paul came and submitted to that. So we need that type of church structure. So, moving on. So, part of the trials that we're going to look at now that Paul was was going to be facing, so we saw the rejoicing. They came in, they told the stories, everything's great, uh, God's moving, the Gentiles are getting safe. Now we're going to go to the suffering. But part of the suffering comes in this tension. Remember, we're kind of in between times, tension in between the times. Look at verse 20. And they said to them, you see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews who have believed. So there's a revival going on in Jerusalem. They are zealous for the law. And they have been told about you, that you teach the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or to walk according to our customs. What then is to be done? You will, they will certainly hear that you have come. Do therefore what we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. This is a Nazarite vow. We'll come back to that. Take these men and purify yourselves along with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads. That's part of the, the vow. Thus we will know that there is nothing in what they have been told about you, but that you yourself also live in observance of the law. But as for the Gentiles who had believed, we have sent a letter with our judgment that they should abstain from that which has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and for what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. We saw that earlier in the book of Acts. So we, we still, even though the, the Jews are rejoicing in certain respect that the Gentiles are coming in, the Jews are still struggling. They're trying to figure out where do they fit, right? And it's because there's a tension here. Uh, that is happening circumstantially. They're hearing, you know, the Jews in Jerusalem are hearing, well, Paul's out there undermining everything we believed our whole life. Everything that was entrusted to us from Moses. And the Jews are, are being told to forsake Moses. The believing Jews were holding fast to the law. And they were doing the rituals, the shaving of the head. That's part of a, a Nazarite vow, a, a vow of consecration that, that you could take voluntarily. And, and they were operating in that. So in your notes there, I said there is a tension with the old covenant and its fulfillment in the new covenant in Christ as the temple was still operating with its priests and sacrifices. So just roughly... 33 AD, Jesus dies on the cross, right? Raises from the dead. The gospel goes out. And they're preaching the gospel. And now, you know, this is about end of uh, 50s, early 50s. So about 20 years have happened. But guess what? The gospel's going out. The Gentiles are coming in. But the temple's still going on. Well, I thought this was the new covenant. And can you see the tension if you were a Jew? Well, we still have the temple. 
We still have the Levites. We still have the sacrifices. We still have all this going on. And now we have missionaries out there telling everybody, forget about the temple. Don't worry about the temple. Well, which is it? So you can see how it, a, a sincere person could be legitimately uh, confused. But remember, Jesus talked about this. In, uh, in 70 AD, the temple would be destroyed. Remember, Jesus taught them that in Matthew 24. He says, hey, there's a day coming and then that not even one stone of that temple is going to be left on another. In other words, it's going to be scraped all the way to the ground. And it is to this day. It's gone. The temple is gone. That happened in 70 AD. The Old Testament worship, though, was still operating, and uh, yet the Gentiles were coming into the kingdom of God without any of that. But Jesus also predicted that. Jesus said to the woman, the Samaritan woman, you remember? The Samaritans were like, you know, completely uh, ostracized by the Jews. Jews would go 30, 40 miles out of their way walking to Jerusalem just to stay out of Samaria because they hated the Samaritans. Jesus went to the Samaritans and told this woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain, because the Samaritans thought they, they, they had a rival temple, uh, either in this mountain in Samaria, nor in Jerusalem, will you worship the Father. True worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. So the Samaritans, because they were ostracized, created a rival temple, but they knew the true temple was in Jerusalem. And Jesus is saying, true worship won't happen in either place. It'll become a spiritual worship. And where is our temple now? Our temple is in heaven, right? Whose builder and maker is God. So we see that, and Jesus promised that this old covenant temple was passing away and that the new covenant would break forth. In Hebrews, it says this, Christ has obtained a ministry that is much more excellent than the old, as the covenant he mediates is better. In speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete, and that which is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. So in these times, they didn't know that. They're, they're living in the middle. It's easy for us to look back in history and go, oh, they should have known better. They didn't. And I'm imagining if we were there, we probably would have struggled with it as well. And so this new covenant is coming through. And in the new covenant, as we've seen, there's not Jew or Gentile. Or there, we're all one new man in Jesus Christ. Jesus came in two ways, right? Jesus was the second Adam. He's bringing in a new creation. And he is the true Israel of God. He is the one who fulfilled all of the Old Testament, and he is the promised new seed. So things are changing, and it's dramatic. And now all who are in union with Christ, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, are made up of living stones. Did you know that? You're a living stone, and you're part of the new temple. We're all being fashioned into a temple to our God. This is the language of the new covenant, and they were learning this. Now, Paul think of this, is in the middle of all this. So Paul's a Jew. He has his ministry to the Gentiles, and he's telling the Gentiles what he'd been told. Look, don't worry about the temple. Don't worry about the sacrifices. Just abstain from, from things sacrificed to idol and blood and sexual immorality, and you're good. And why? Well, that's what was uh, adjudicated in Acts 15 by the council in Jerusalem. But remember, at the end of the second missionary journey... Paul made a trek all the way to the temple, and on his way, what did he stop and do? He stopped and shaved his head. Well, wait a minute. What's he doing? Even the, the apostle Paul was fulfilling Nazarite vows, even as he's preaching the gospel to the Gentiles. Now, I know this is deep. I'm, I'm losing some of you. Wake up here. Uh, but I wanted you to see the tension here. So Paul even though he's preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, is still living as a Jew and still using the Nazarite process to fulfill his vow. Because some people are thinking, well, this is hypocritical. Why are they, if the temple doesn't matter, then why is Paul going into the temple? Like, as, they were, as they were recommended by James. Is James trying to deceive people? Is this subterfuge? No. Because while the temple was there, these rites were still received by the Lord. 
And Paul was even doing that. Rather, uh, when Paul was out preaching to the Gentiles, he was telling the Gentiles not to uh, follow the Jewish traditions. He wasn't telling the Jews they didn't have to. That was a slander. So Paul comes back into town, and everybody's gunning for him. So verse 26, Then Paul took the men, these are the four guys, and the next day he purified himself along with them and went into the temple, giving notice that the days of purification would be fulfilled and the offering presented for each of them. So the Nazarite vow was on. These four men were going to do it, and, and Paul even associated himself with the vow. And looked like it went well. They went in, they paid their money, they say, hey, we'll be back in a week uh, to fulfill the vow, and everything's fine. But remember all the promises and prophecies that had happened? We looked at them last week. What was supposed to happen to Paul? They were warning him in every city, if you go into Jerusalem, this is what's going to happen to you. They're going to enslave you or, or arrest you and uh, bind you. So now Paul goes in the temple, pays the money, goes to the vow. Huh, everything's fine. Or so it seems, right? So what happens next? Well, number three, expect false accusations. So when the seven days were completed, the Jews from Asia, now you don't know this backstory. remember in Asia, the, there was a group of Jews that were literally following Paul from city to city, making trouble, and remember there were riots. They would literally create riots where Paul was preaching, and because they hated his message. So some of these Jews were in Jerusalem. And seeing Paul in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who is teaching everyone everywhere against the people and the law and the play, this place. Moreover, he even brought Greeks into the temple and has defied the holy place, defiled the holy place. And for this, for they had previously seen Trometheus the Ephesian with him in the city. And they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. So this should sound familiar. These Jews are stirring up trouble. Remember, we joke, wherever Paul went, there was either a revival or a riot, right? Well, why? Because the, uh, many, many times it was the Jews who saw the message of the gospel as a threat to their faith. And they see Paul in the temple and they lose their minds. Can you imagine? Bad enough, he's preaching out there. Now they come to Jerusalem, and there's the Apostle Paul. And they falsely accuse Paul of three things. He's preaching against the people of the Jews. Well, was he? What do we know about Paul's preaching? Paul always reminded people that, yes, the Jews were crucified. Uh, the Jews did crucify Jesus, but by the way, this was according to the predestined plan of God. Right? We can show the prophecies. The scriptures predicted that would happen. And, and Paul would boldly preach that salvation is of the Jews. Christ was a Jew. God uses the Jews. When Paul would go out in ministry, who did he first go to to preach the gospel? The Jews. In Romans, what does Paul say about his kinsmen according to the flesh? He said, I would, uh, I would allow myself to be damned. I would rather go to hell myself than to see my brethren, according to the flesh, not come to faith. Paul was not against the Jewish people. He, his heart was broken for the Jewish people. So that was a lie. That he was preaching against the law. No, Paul wasn't preaching against the law. He was putting the law in its proper place. And how that Jesus had come to fulfill the law. And that the temple and the sacrifices and, and all of that was fulfilled by Christ. And even the cross is what? The fulfillment of the curse of the law. Jesus absorbed our judgment. He became the curse of the law so that we would not have to endure it. If anything, Paul was upholding the law, only properly applying it in the light of the cross. They also accused him of preaching against the temple. Remember what Jesus said? Of himself, he said, one greater than the temple is among you. 
So the, there's not a problem with the temple because the temple pointed to who? Pointed to Jesus. It was all looking forward to Jesus. Jesus is the sacrifice. Jesus is the high, high priest, the true high priest. We're not preaching against, against the temple. The temple was an object lesson until the real thing came. And the real thing was in Jesus Christ. That's why we don't need a temple and don't want a temple. A temple would be idolatrous. Christ is greater than the temple. And he has already come. And so we rejoice in that. So in that sense, he was not preaching against the temple. He was preaching of its fulfillment. And they also said, oh, and he brought uh, Trometheus into the temple. Did that ever happen? No. So why... Why do I say this to you? If you're going to be serious about Christ, if you're going to follow him, be aware the devil is the father of lies and the accuser of the brethren. This is his toolbox, false accusations. And if you're doing God's work, that's what the devil's going to do. And he's going to stir things up. He'll stir it up, frankly, at work. Sometimes in your own home, different things will come up that are completely slanderous and not true. The devil is a punk and he's going to lie about you. So be aware of that. Just be prepared. Oh, I can't believe they said that. Oh, yeah. But here's my admonition to you. Make sure you're not doing the devil's work. Make sure you're not bringing false accusations against your brothers and sisters in Christ. Remember how many times Jesus had to rebuke his own disciples because they were speaking for the devil. And Jesus rebuked them. Let's make sure that our mouths are guarded and that we don't give opportunity for Satan to use us against one another in the church. So, But expect that it's going to happen. And then finally... What do we find? There's suffering in God's mission. And I hope that's not news to you. Then we read in verse 30, All the city was stirred up, and the people ran together. They seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple, and at once the gates were shut. And as they were seeking to kill him, word came to the tribune of the cohort that, that all of Jerusalem was in confusion. He at once took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw the tribune, the tribune and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. When the tribune came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains, he inquired who he was and what he had done. Some in the crowd were shouting one thing, some another. As he could not learn the facts because of the uproar, he ordered, them to be, he ordered Paul to be brought to the barracks. And when he came to the steps, he was actually carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the crowd, for the mob followed, crying out, away with him. So the crowd gets frenzied. Literally, they grabbed him. They were trying to murder him. That's what the text says, right? But then somebody in the crowd had a cell phone and dialed 911. I I don't know. But somehow, this gentleman, the tribune of the cohort, remember, in Jerusalem, Jerusalem was notorious for trouble, right? And stirring up trouble. And so you had to kind of rule with an iron fist. And it was the responsibility of the tribune to make sure peace remained in the city, by the way, if the tribune failed, it could cost him his life, at least his position. So, interestingly, so they're, they're grabbing Paul, they're, they've, they've run him out of the temple, they're beating on him, trying to kill him. The tribune shows up with the centurions, and what happens? The Jews are panicked, right? Because they realize, uh-oh, this could get ugly against them. And they stop beating Paul. Then we read, kind of interesting, that the tribune arrests Paul, and and we see this little detail with two chains. Does that sound familiar? What did Agabus prophesy earlier? Remember, he took off the robe, and he bound his hands and his feet. 
So the fulfillment of the prophet Agabus that told Paul, this is what's going to happen to you when you go to Jerusalem. We see it literally being fulfilled, and, and, and uh, Luke includes that little detail for us. So he tries to get the facts, right? The tribune's trying to, what's going on? Why are you trying to murder this guy? What did he do? The crowd's yelling out. That there's a lot of uproar. I'm sure they're falsely accusing him of everything. And then the, the, the soldiers, I think, get a little bit afraid. They realize, this is going to get out of hand. So what do they do? They take Paul, and they're going to take him up to the barracks. Now, the barracks were just outside of the temple. They're going up the stairs, and they're going to stop there. Next week, we're going to look at the sermon that Paul preaches in the face of this. But he's being taken all the way up to the barracks as the Jews are chanting away with him. Does that sound familiar? What were the Jews doing not so many years earlier with our Christ? Away with him. Crucify him. So there's a sense in which Paul is kind of entering into a cruciform type of suffering. And here we see the Gentiles intervene. And remember, this is kind of becomes a pattern. The Gentiles actually intervene to save Paul from the Jews. Isn't that interesting? We see that also earlier in some of those riots that the Jews had caused. At the beginning of, of the gospel going out, it was the Gentiles who were resisting the gospel. And now that the gospel's been going out for this time, now it's the Jews. The Jews see the threat, and now it's the Gentiles. God's going to use Gentiles to preserve Paul's life, and in doing so, promote the gospel. And that's good, and that's right. Now, we talk about the civil magistrates, political authorities. What is, what is the political authority supposed to do? According to Romans 13, they're supposed to be the deacon of God. They're the minister of God. That's what it says, but the word there is diakonos. They are the servant of God. And what is their job? To promote the will of God, including the preservation of innocent life. So when the government is doing their job, that's what they're doing. Isn't it sad in this situation, the people who had the law of God, the Jews, were violating their own law. They were, they were going to murder Paul on the spot. No due process, no trial, no nothing, just mob violence. That never happens in America, right? That never happens. Oh, no, it does. And what do we see here? The civil magistrate did his job, praise God, when the civil magistrate is doing what they're supposed to do. It is the duty of any politician, especially in America, because we swore uh, uh, oaths to the Constitution if they're in office, they are to be defending your God-given rights. And what's more fundamental than your right to life? And so we pray that God would do that not only for our neighbors and for ourselves, but for the unborn. When the government's doing its job, it's preserving life, all forms of life. So again, God used Gentiles to, to save the Apostle Paul's life in order to further the mission of God. So we praise God for that. And when the governments are doing their job, they create, remember Paul says we want there to be a peaceful situation. Why? So we can do the work of the ministry, so we can preach the gospel. And so we pray to that end, and we see it modeled here by God's grace. So what's the conclusion? Kingdom life, then, is joyous, there's some rejoicing, and hard, there's suffering, and absolutely worth everything. Because in the end, nothing else matters. So may God cause us to rejoice together with those who are rejoicing. Remember, even the angels celebrate when a sinner is brought home to, to salvation. But we're also to suffer with those who are suffering, who are grieving. Knowing that any suffering in this life is not worthy to be compared with the joy that is to be revealed in us and the glory that is ours. The Bible calls it a light and momentary affliction. 
that we experience here. It may not feel like it, but relatively speaking, it's light, it's momentary, and especially compared with the weight of glory that God has in store for you. Do you think about that at all? See, we need to have this living hope of heaven so that when the suffering comes, when the frustrations come, when the setbacks come, we can stay motivated to do the work that God has called us to do, looking for the blessed hope, even the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because when Christ, our life, appears, we who have been shielded, the Bible says, through faith by God's saving power, the Bible promises us that we will appear with Him and partake in His glory. Are you looking forward to that? It's worth it, saints. Let's give ourselves to that work. Let's pray.